Right, um, welcome everyone. Um, just before I get into it, we have, uh, um, we, um, for, so for the Q&A at the end of our talk, um, we have an app um, up called Mentimeter. Um, I think that the um, details are all up on the screen here, and also for the people at home, it should be on the screen up there for you too. Um, so you can either um, get the QR code just with your camera, um, or you can go onto the website, which I believe all the details are there as well. Um, and just to get started in your own time, um, there's a little question up there for you um, that we'd love to I'd love to um, you to answer, um, just to kind of get a feel for who's in the audience and yeah, what to talk about this evening. So yeah, just in your own time, feel free to jump on that. So um, without further ado, uh, quickly about what we're going to be speaking about this evening. Um, the fashion industry is on the cusp of monumental change. The boundaries between technology and our clothing have become increasingly blurred, uh, intertwining the old and new uh, and blurring the boundaries between fashion, function and culture. Um, not only does this new face of fashion change how we'll interact with what we wear, it also offers new opportunities to overcome legacy problems within the industry. Um, tonight we'll hear about how we can refine the traceability of our fabrics, uh, new opportunities to improve sustainability across the supply chain, and also what NFTs have to do with fashion. So, uh, quickly, a very well welcome, well, warm welcome <laughs> to our fantastic panelists tonight. Um, so to help us dig into this huge topic, um, uh, our two pioneers at the forefront of this revolution. Uh, we have Zaritza Asante and Elodie Nowinski here with us tonight. So welcome to you both and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. So um, just to set the scene a little bit, um, I'd love to hear from both of you just to introduce yourselves um, and a bit about your work and maybe why fashion is important to you. Do you want to kick us off, Zaritza? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was just right there. Yes, so Zaritza and my clothing brand is Zari. It's a capsule collection and it's a celebration of the cultures that um, are the basis of me, I would say. So we're talking about I was brought up in Scotland. I would say I'm Scottish, but it's not true. Don't say that my birth certificate. I'm Scottish. And my parents are Ghanaian and throughout my childhood, I'll just say really quickly that I always say this, my bones alone are more than a size eight, but I spent my youth trying to fit into size eight skinny jeans and things that didn't fit because I thought that's how I was supposed to look. But as, as I've grown up and as I learned more about the different cultures that speak into me, I learned there was something more to be said about my identity that I wasn't naturally able to express within the mainstream fashion industry. And so that, be that began a journey of identity for me. And it was when I was in Ghana working that I saw every shape celebrated. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't black, I was just a person. And so I could just, you know, decide who am I or find out who am I. And then I started to have this relationship with fabrics and what they said and what they meant. And, Zari was born, so it means so much to me because it cuts past all the things people say about who I'm supposed to be, it allows me to express myself in a way that no one can take away from me, and it allows me to engage the world as me. So that's, that's what fashion does for me, or that's what clothing does for me, and that's what I want to bring to fashion. So I don't think fashion necessarily does that for people, but it can, and it should. Yeah. Those ideas in a moment, but first reality. Well, uh, I'm an academic, okay, so I've worked in uni for the longest time to actually try to explain to my students and to a large audience exactly what you just said. <laughs> so, um, history and sociology of fashion have been my subject for, for almost 15, 20 years now. Uh, I got into it, I can't even remember how, uh, very serendipitous, but because it doesn't exist as such in French. Mm. This doesn't exist in France. So I'm first and foremost a historian, and then I deviated towards this evil that's fashion. <laughs> Just to prove that, I had to prove myself a lot uh, as a historian and sociologist, just to see fashion is worth studying. It's not just for frivolous women. And I uh, spent, yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, second industry in the whole world textile. 
we should probably study it. And the study of fashion is all about really exactly what you just said. It's embodying, so it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a creative business, not art. I keep saying that, a lot of people are gonna shoot at me, but it's a business that's creative and that's serving multiple purposes, which is, you know, protecting us, weather, and to guarantee our, our, our pewter, so that we're not going up naked, but it serves everything that you've said, mm -hmm. which is our identity, the relationship that we have to others, mm -hmm. the relationship that we have to our body, how we evolve as women, mm -hmm. uh, as men, as anything in between, and how we actually present ourselves to the world. It's the first thing that we, saw, we see in people, and that has been my work, and now I'm literally delving into another piece of work, which is tartan. That's my, that's my new thing. Um, I'm trying to work out on how we can explain tartan. So that's a very Scottish iconic thing uh, in a heritage perspective, but also history and also the future of this mm -hmm. and how everything that you said can be actually uh, put together within, you know, exhibition, within a story about how tartan is related to Scottish history, but also the diaspora. And I know that's a very important to word, uh, words to you um, and how we all relate to this. So functions of fashion and how we make it work and how we make it work in the future. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. I'm just gonna throw it straight back to you again, Elodie. What does, um, what does fashion tech mean to you? Because that's what we're here to talk about today. Okay. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is data. Uh, it's my favourite little thing. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in an age where internet didn't happen, it was not there. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we came up with all this data about fashion. So anything we could see about how we produce fashion could be now related to data, to information, massive information. And fashion tech to me as a way to not to, um, to downsize creativity, which is usually something that frightens a lot of fashion people, are we going to get automatized and all wear the same thing, like in those uh, futuristic movies, and usually they're quite good looking, but they all look the same. Uh, so is that dystopian thing happening? I actually don't think so, because fashion tech is here to probably make fashion way more sustainable than it is. It's one of the worst industries in the world, we all know it, at all kind of levels. And to me, the data, fashion tech should be linking to how data can improve both creativity, but also the way we produce so that not every responsibility falls onto the wearer. Mm -hmm. Do you feel guilty when you buy something? Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. But why should you actually? Are you at the, at the forefront of producing fashion? Do you, do you, you know, work in fashion mills and stuff like that? No, you don't. So how other actors than just the end consumers like you do, how do we actually act upon it? And that's what fashion text means to me. Again, lots of things I want to jump in, but I'll leave them for a little bit later. Do you have anything that you would like to add? What does fashion tech no, mean to you? Much of what yeah. um, Elodie said, I would say that the creativity um, being harnessed holistically so mm -hmm. that it is the sustainability aspect of it. So anything that supports the creative aspect of clothing, of whatever it is that is being made for the future without harming community without harming the world, you know, or at least embracing what's already there, the natural system, working with it rather than against it. To me, that is technology. How do we do it? That's fashion tech. How do we do it more efficiently so that there is a future, so that we're not leaving something that is dross to the next generations? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Right. Um, ooh. One moment. Sorry. Um, so, Elodie, I wanted to jump back to you again. I know you touched on data a little bit there, and I just wanted to dive into that a little bit more. Um, but specifically, I wanted to open with what sort of legacy uh, challenges do you see the fashion um, industry facing? And how do you think data can help unlock those challenges and help us move forward? There's so many ways to answer this question, but I'm just going to, you know, uh, pick up one, one little thing, which is really a pinhole in the whole system, but it's probably uh, the devastating effect of massification of fashion. So um, I think the, the worst legacy of the fashion industry started from, sorry, historian moment here, the 60s on, when, you know, massive production started to be made of beautiful things, because 
it became appealing. If you mass produce ugly stuff, people are not going to buy it, right? In the 60s, revolution about massively produced appealing things. I mean, everything almost happened in London and in the UK with Twiggy and all this. Suddenly, it's a start. It's really a starting point. Then it can on and on and on with massive industrialization in the 90s and the 2000s. Group like Inditex, H&M, Uniqlo, you know all these guys, right? Produce massively available anywhere in the world, one click, don't have it all. That's, for me, something that's there. Is it gonna change? I'm not too sure, right? When you go to the post office and you see the ASOS piles of returns, how are we gonna change this? Well, maybe not by, down, by again, forcing the consumer to change its, its behavior because the behaviors are there. And sociologically speaking, we know it's very hard to change back, right? It's more probably about how data can actually inform producers, guys who are manufacturing things, in order to scale back and to avoid returns. Um, before we, we got into the panel, we talked about sizing, right? How many times do you have to, when you buy something online, to send it back because you order a size A12, whatever, and of course doesn't suit? I mean, hello. How many times does that happen? All the time. So if we can scale back and say, okay, my data, scanning my body, right? I'm just imagining things here. Sending to you, manufacturer, what I wear, what I, and then I can maybe try it on virtually, whatever that means. Well, that actually enables the process to be a bit more streamlined. No returns, that would be a good start. I'm just like putting things out there. Can I jump in? Is it correct that most of our clothes that we return just go straight to the... Yeah. I wouldn't say most, but some, some brands are notoriously known for doing this because we have to understand that linked to massification, the value of clothing is almost nil. So when you produce a piece of clothing, whatever garment that is, you pay a certain price, right? Whatever the price range is, I'm talking Chanel to Primark, it's a fake thing, it's a made up thing, okay? And the minute that you have it in your hands, the value decreases, okay? And so basically sending it back means that, is there any value? So you have the shipping, you have the handling, you have the, literally the um, uh, storage of it. Actually, I'd rather have this two pounds t-shirt thrown somewhere, preferably somewhere else than Europe or the US, if you know where I'm going with this. So yeah, everything's wrong about that. And I understand that you use, um, you've used machine learning in the past to help optimize that data stream for producers. Yes, so what we did was mostly about trend detection and prediction. So it was not about sizing, but it could totally be, be implemented. So what we did was, was a bit more, um, how can we actually predict what people are going to like, right? Which is quite <laughs> difficult. Um, and to avoid massive uh, miss out. So a whole collection, and if you think uh, high fashion to like massive produced fashion, just like how do you make sure that you're not spending thousands of pounds into something that people are going to go like, yeah, I liked it on Kim Kardashian, but somehow me, I hate it, so no thank you. So that's, that's that, because of course we also are influenced by media, whatever the media are, but then you put it on yourself, well, are you really going to wear like a full spandex outfit, whatnot, you know, on a regular basis to scale? Hopefully not. That's a personal opinion, but do you get my point? Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Thank you. Um, now I just wanted to shift tra track a little bit and do like the shortest overview of Web3, <laughs> probably in the history of panels, um, because I think, I think that's, uh, for me, you know, um, what you do is so in relation of, you know, the borderland of what tech can do right now and, mm. um, and something that's as old as what we wear. And um, so very, very quickly, what is Web3 as you understand it and how are you implementing it into your, into your line? Okay, Web3 as I understand it is basically the latest iteration of Web2. It's how we engage. Everyone who has a smartphone has the capability to be engaging with Web3, which is, literally from Facebook to Instagram, which was Web 2. Now we're in Web 3, where we have the virtual realities, where we're having meetings in this digital space, having conversations. Um, yeah, it's, it's more just the, the next phase of Web 3 and 
probably nobody ever called Web 2 Web 2. I think it's funny that we call it Web 3, mm. but yeah, it literally is the upgrade of what we've been doing for the last however many years, mm. where there's more decentralization. So people are not owning your data necessarily. You have more control over what you're doing, what you're putting out, and you're able to engage with people um, where they can see a version of you in some instances. How we're using it in Zari, we're using it for tracing our products our physical products. So we are using blockchain technology whereby there may be a QR code in our garments and that's scanned and they can see from beginning to end where does our fabric come from? Where was it printed? Um, where has it gone? Where, where was it manufactured? Are they getting paid? How are they getting paid? How they, just like what you would scan if you were getting it, you've got a, a FedEx parcel and you can see beginning to end. So that's how we're using it initially. We're building out spaces within the metaverse, sorry to bring another word in, <laughs> but we're building out spaces where we can create community. That's ultimately what we're doing in Web3 is we're building community with those who would be wearing Zari clothes so we can build out a more sustainable brand, clothing brand, so yeah. And I love the overlap there, um, with the, you know, different approaches to, yeah. to um, tackling the same problem. Yeah. And I do think, sorry, to, yeah, please. I do think uh, to what you were saying about in terms of the machine learning and, and the data we were saying earlier, that it's so important. And, it, and I believe that it will speak to like my next phase as a brand, because we're trying to collect the data so that we can actually create products that people will buy and keep, not return, but we'll also have some sort of, we're talking about provenance, so we're, you know, in the old days, people would have a wedding dress that was passed down generations. So if I create a product that is, has that value or has that value, people perceive that value, then we're speaking to what is sustainability. We're speaking to our identity at the same time, but we're not being as frivolous as we've been in the generations before. So I think it's, it's, it's essential that these things are married together. I really like this because it talks about the story that's built in the clothing. Yeah. And uh, whenever our ancestors were literally doing their own clothing, passing on from one generation to the next, what are you doing is creating a history story yes. to your garment and also building a future for us yeah. through the communities. Yeah. Uh, when we did our project about trend detection, Web3 was not there yet. Yeah. There was no talk <laughs> about the metaverse that I was aware of. So basically it adds a layer to it. Yeah. And um, it's full circle about what I said about massification, destroying the value of clothing, of objects. Now you are recreating a value, sentimental, economical, and not financial value to it um, that, that makes the object becoming more than just a piece of, of cloth and just a real object, so to speak, to, to, to cherish and like. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, definitely. Absolutely, I love that. It's a perfect segue into my next segment as well, um, because um, what I love about what you both are doing is just the deep similarities um, in there, the, you know, the um, we talked about heritage, so I'm going to avoid that word, the history, the diaspora, and just using how um, people are connected through clothing, or the threads of connections, as I was thinking about a, a bit earlier. Yeah. Um, Elodie, I'm, I wanted to talk a little bit about tartan, just very briefly, because um, when we picture Scotland, we can't, you know, tartan and bagpipes, it's, it, that's so tied into to what we see. Um, has that always been the way? I could talk about that for hours. Um, well, let's rain check in 2025 when the Tartan Centre is open, so you'll have a full answer to your question. But if I can put it in a nutshell, mm -hmm. yes, no. Mm -hmm. So there's always um, a different take on the cultural object. Mm -hmm. Scottish people, I'm not, I'm French, right? So, carry some slack here. Scottish people or identifying as Scottish people will have a particular take on it, okay? Now, people who are from the Scottish diaspora, I'm thinking the US, Canada, Australia, all of these, the, those countries have a different take on it, which is also related to identity. And then you have the whole, um, I would say built up stories, which are starting in the 18th century. I mean, I'm gonna throw Walter Scott, you know, all of these guys into it. And um, it's about how people who do not have Scottish heritage are looking at it, okay. So there's a lot of cliches around it. I mean, we've seen Braveheart probably, Freedom and all of this. And all of this, I like to see as part of Tartan. Mm -hmm. 
the real story, I put a lot of you know, inverted comma here, so what happened, and that's why I'm, I'm using history, right? So the history of the cloth of tartan, how it was invented, da -da, and we don't know much about it, right? But it certainly is a very Scottish thing because nowhere else can we find that kind of weaving patterns and its relationship to geography and then later on what we call clans, quite loosely, right? Now, what about what happened after that and the whole mythology of whenever you hear bagpipes, oh, Scotland, here we are, right? That's constructed through uh, literature, films. I mean, Outlander, this series uh, on Netflix, has been doing massive thing for this Scottish cliche of it, right? So everything is actually real tartan thing, and it's within Scotland and out with Scotland. It's not the property of anyone because that's a moving object. Vivian Westwood, Alexander McQueen, whomever, Ralph Lauren, all of these guys are taking this culture and making it their own, and I think tartan is every single piece and what's coming next as if the future of it. Absolutely um, and just to kind of dig a little bit more into the National Tartan Centre because I'm not sure how much everyone knows about the plans um, and I know that obviously you worked in education and technology. Um, how are you integrating some of those edutech, edu may I, if I may, <laughs> ideas into the, yeah. into the centre? So for now, it's just very early days, right? Uh, so I cannot tell you where it's going to be this, this and this. It's going to be all dance, dancing and singing. But can you actually think of a museum now without digital technology? No. That would be, I mean, seriously. Um, so instead of doing, unfortunately, what a lot of institutions have been doing, that is we have a collection then how can we digitalize it? How can we make it appealing to new generation? How can we gamify it? We will have the luxury, the absolute luxury of building up straight for the digital minded, digital age, Web3 and all of this. So how's it going to be? I don't know yet, <laughs> but I think it's going to be cool. And to you, Zaretza, how do you see um, yeah, the, the, the culture and history of what you've brought through, brought into life um, as someone from Ghana who's, you know, identifies as Scottish and giving something to the African diaspora here. Yeah. How do you see that, that those threads of connection <laughs> come okay. through? I don't want to answer that as a separate, because mm -hmm. I think to what LD was saying yeah, about Tartan, I think it's really important to understand that Tartan does have its history and it has its truth. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Scotland and their Tartan and you look at Ghana mm -hmm. and its Kinti, there's a shared history. They're in different places, but there is a shared history. And when you look at the Kinti, it speaks of a people and there are different colors that mean different things. I know they said that in Tartan that may not be the same, but I don't shy away from history because I don't believe that you can properly move forward with, without taking what the past has lent to you. And so even as I was so proud as a child to wear tartan, you'll see pictures with me with tartan on and I was so proud. And the minute my mother tried to put me in African clothes, I was like, where are you going to hide me? Because I'm not going out. And it was later, but because I loved being Scottish, I loved the fact that they would look at this black child, because I was Scottish, that's why they would say, where are you from? I'm from Scotland. No, where are you really from? No, I'm from Scotland. No, where are you really from? Okay. I'm from Ghana, but if you send me there, I won't know how to communicate with anyone. <laughs> it was later that I learned about my culture. And so, as I said before, so now as I've learned about that, I'm doing it with the utmost respect because I already had gained a respect here with my tartan and, and then was able to, you know, go through the culture in Ghana and say, okay, but I'm a combination of all of this. And so when those from the African diaspora are here. So people like me who are first generation, we have a different mindset to even those who were grown, who are in, in, in Africa. So I want to bring the truth of that. So I take, the, as you're saying, it's, it's how you relate to these textiles now. I take those and I'm saying, this is what I believe to be a true expression that many will share. And how do I validate that? the conversations that we've had and, you know, understanding that everything we wear means something. So using that tech to now bring something that we couldn't ordinarily get means that I'm able to iterate faster. 
but I'm also able to make something that can have a future. Because as you said, we're writing history now. History isn't just then. Like, yes, there's all that that was there and, and it does have an inheritance, but what are we writing now that speaks to the future? And that's what I would like to see Zari do, that you can see the Scotland coming through and you can see the Ghana coming through, but not just the Ghana, the, I, 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 le I would like to represent the whole one. I don't know how well I'll do that, but you know, you know, it's, it's those kind of things because the world is diverse. We have shared stories and, and, and it's okay for us to share that, to understand the differences, but bring them together and make something that doesn't take away from our identities, but allows us to express them together. And so that for me, the tech aspect of that, like, I'm so grateful for Web3. I know people be like, three, really? No, I am, because what it's done is it's taken away the borders. Now, I don't have to coalesce to traditional fashion houses and how they did fashion. I don't have to wait for them to approve of me because now I can enter in and I can take ground and people will either like it or they'll hate it, but I'll immediately get that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Hope that answers the question. No, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to talk a bit more about sustainability. I know we've touched on it already. Um, uh, yeah, as we all know, Fast, you know, fast fashion. Talked about a bit, a bit about just the over production um, of clothing, and you know, Bangladesh swimming and offcuts, and mm -hmm. you know, there are obviously major sustainability issues across the industry. Um, you know, what what problems or it's a, do you think that we need to be looking at right now? What 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 do you see within Zari as something that you can take that step forward? I think I began from a different perspective. I'm, I'm fairly new and I was always brought up to make use of what we had. So when my mother was making clothes, I never really saw waste. So that wasn't an issue for me. It was, what are you going to do with this? So I've began Zari in the same way, whereby it's like, okay, even when I made my, my first iteration of clothes, it was like, okay, this is how much material I can afford. What can I do with this? And that's going to run through the whole collection, but it's not just about the clothes. For me, sustainability is about the culture. That, that's, Zari answers a, a question. It's not just there because it's answering the question of ethnicities who were having to wear clothes that didn't fit necessarily their body shapes. And, and we know that that goes across anyway, shoes that don't fit our shape because or normally in, in Europe, um, people have an arch in their foot. So when they see black people with a flatter foot, they say there's an abnormality, which actually that's not correct. So it meant that when they were wearing shoes and still wear shoes to this day, a lot of them have back issues. That's not common knowledge. I'm able to look at that, but that's part of the sustainability story because if you're buying shoes that you can never wear, is that not a waste? It's a waste, but you have to wear shoes, but the shoes that you need, you're not getting made. So with Zara, we want to collect the data to be able to change how we're making these shoes, because I do boots, so how we make the clothes, try and make it as, it, not to make it as slow as possible, because we talk about fast fashion, but it, you, it depends on what your process is and what you're doing. You could be fast and still be sustainable, but we keep saying fast, fast, fast fashion. And I think we have to be really careful because so, sometimes we're going to bring solutions that are going to be tomorrow's problem. Yeah. So if I answer a need, if I'm able to meet a need that is existing and create a brand that will have people keep wearing the things, wearing them continuously, loving the things, then that's part of my sustainability story. If I am producing as locally as possible, but not just producing locally, working with partners who are efficient in their production. So asking them about what technology they're using, asking them about the prints they're using, that's what, that's what I'm doing. So I keep asking the why, and it's not because I want to be sustainable per se, it's because I believe in doing things responsibly. I want to get the most out of what I have access to. And so being in Web3 for me as part, part of the story is that I can get information from now on. I'm not going to do the physical garments for us. What I'm going to do is produce them digitally because we have digital, we have digital software that we can do that. I'm producing digitally. I'm going to test that with my market. And then what is popular, what people like is what I'm going to produce. That's how I'm going to do it. And I think that's the best way to have a brand sustainable, but will create legacy. So, yeah. Absolutely. Is there anything that you'd 
light at the uh, LED. I, mm. see. I think it's a very, uh, sustainability is, is used a lot in fashion and we know that there's a lot of greenwashing, so I'm not digging into there. For me, there's like one step that sometimes we just forget, and I'm not saying you, do, you are, but it's materials. Um, take a look, a close look, it's like a question for the audience. Take a close look at what you have in your wardrobe. So I have a lot of people saying to me, well, I'm not a fashion person, I'm totally sustainable because I only have a bunch of things. Okay, what are they made of? And you look into it and you discover that none of it is made out of sustainable material. What is a su su ooh, sustainable material? Uh, guess what? Well, have a look at what we do. I mean, this part of the world has based all of its switches pretty much on wool, right? Uh, I mean, there are sheep everywhere here. So um, there's a point to be made about how do we relate to those non-new technologies as AKA wool, very sustainable in every kind of way, uh, very practical. And how do we make them in the long run more usable, uh, more widely available? How do we make the things that that maybe it's my historical cool take on things, but we already have pretty good stuff, right? How do we link a sheep somewhere in Hades to you? Um, and that's probably my sustainability issue is like, you know, a missing link between what we already have in large quantities compared to, you know, producing more. Even cotton, you keep looking at, oh, it's cotton, it's good. Well, cotton is actually quite terrible. Um, and, oh, new um, tensile. Oh. So there's a lot to be said about material as a first step, uh, all the way towards exactly what you see. And I think c consumer behavior, I, I keep on saying, don't blame people. Stop blaming people, right? Enough, enough is enough. But as a consumer, just out of pure curiosity, Look at what your clothes are made, not wear, because that's too, big a, that's too big a question. What are they made of? Would be probably a good start for you to just like think about things, do you know what I mean? So that's probably for me the material. What are things made of? Question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is all about traceability, um, because I know that that's something that's quite dear to you, um, the traceability of those, of those fabrics. Um, I, like I know, for example, you know, we're talking about tartan, but it's actually, you know, often tartan, I understand, is made here and then used in, by luxury brands who don't say that it's been where it's actually been made. Um, if, if you wanted to speak to that. Well, yeah, well, tartan is, is a, such a broad word, yes. uh, you know, uh, describing whole different I mean, you can have all sorts of things, like for, from the very well produced to the worst polyester type of thing produced at the end of the world, say souvenir from Edinburgh. Um, the whole question about it is more about uh, luxury is not always to blame because sometimes they revive old ways of doing things, um, but they are also to blame for other things. So it's just about a bit of balance. Trustability, in, 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 I think, is really important in terms of. I said material, but also how it's made and how do you relate to the time it took. So if, if we start thinking about um, this piece of clothing I'm wearing uh, is from there and there and there and has traveled twice as much as I have in my entire life, um, and then it's made of something that is produced out of petrol or whatnot, um, you're probably going to think, wow, maybe I'm going to think twice about it, uh, just like you think twice about buying terrible food. Um, but there's always a question of what can I afford? If I cannot afford something that has been made, you know, nicely, what am I left with? And we're circling back to this, you know, uh, consumer bl blaming on the consumer, the end consumer. So I think trustability is really definitely the responsibility of fashion producers. And how can tech help help the consumer understand exactly? She does it. <laughs> <laughs> if we knew, right? If you buy a check-in and you have seen all of those terrible images of those poor animals being treated terribly, just like, I might not choose check-in for lunch. Well, we can't really see, oh, this poor cotton crop has been badly treated. But then when you go for a, long, a, a bigger 
uh, story a bigger conversation around something and you go, well, my clothing have been made, have, have been made there using this person and da da da. And you start to uh, understand that to make a t-shirt, it's going to take, or a top, whatnot, it's going to take a lot of people from the designer to the person who's going to, you know, stick the label. Maybe going to think twice about how much should that be costing me, right? Maybe instead of buying five, 10 pound t-shirts, I'm just going to buy two. But that's again, that's difficult conversation. So it's, it's going to take a long time. But if we can't realize what it is that's behind what we wear on our very body, right? Ooh, Mike. Um, then we can't, and she's doing it. So that's, that's I think she's, she has the solution. And lots of people are, are, are doing it. But there are lots of people that are getting in on it. And, and I don't think it matters for what reason. Um, but that people are being more transparent. Um, I think that a lot of the consumers don't really care where their garments are. They do care if it's hurting people, but when you go and buy something, you buy it because it's nice. So as you said, I don't think the responsibility is on the consumer. I think the, the responsibility is on the one who produces. It's the, on the creative to think about what is it that they're answering? What, what are they the answer? What, which, why are they answering? And so when they do it, then that shouldn't be a hidden secret. And I was speaking to someone, a couple of marketing person, and he was just saying it's quite difficult in the UK because everything is almost like nobody wants to reveal anything. Whereas for me, I think we learn from the things we speak about. And so it's not a problem for me to share what is my supply chain? Who am I getting what from? What are the decisions? My woolens, they're being produced in um, Northum Northumberland. And so I have conversations with them, uh, but that's, that's a decision I made because I want to have a, a brand that has integrity. So I want to sell to people something that they can keep. I think the day is pretty much gone for big fashion. It's, it's, it's on its way out, but what it looks like next will be dependent on the small producers, small designers like me. We're 90, 99% of business is small business. So if we make those decisions, then that shifts things and it causes the bigger ones to also have to shift their perspective. So, so I yeah. Not, the social media, which is like for pretty much everything, um, has one side, which is we are way more conscious about things and we spread ideas, not all good ones, but good ones as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you see conversations going on about brands who are doing all sorts of shenanigans, that's, and I'm not saying it's going to be an easy transfer into from terrible to super nice mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have much time left, but I'm quite hopeful in the sense that conversation with students, you should see how fiery they are about, oh my God, this brand I used to like, this, this and that, calling them out, da da. So it's, it's almost now a media business. There are a couple of websites who are actually, you know, on a regular basis calling people out mm -hmm. and well, keep on going guys. Hopeful. <laughs> That's the only way to take a step forward, right? Um, so, what organisations, um, uh, business, you know, small businesses that you see, um, what, what, sorry, which ones excite you? Um, you know, from Scotland internationally, are there any where you're like, they're doing it right, and I want to incorporate their ideas? Yeah, please. <laughs> sorry, I should have I should have mentioned. Uh, there, there are a lot of businesses, I, I don't think I can call out any specifically, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of small businesses I'm seeing, a lot of small designers, and, and what they're doing is that they're listening to the customer, listening to their community. I'll say community. Mm -hmm. The ones that are building out, having dialogue with community are the ones that I respect more because what I'm seeing is that they're stopping where they need to stop and they're not letting money decide how they go. Whereas in the past, the business model would say that you need to be making profit by this time or you need to do it that way. But everything shifted when COVID happened. Everything shifted and people started to perceive things differently and started to move forward. So I'm seeing lots of small businesses in Scotland itself and I'm seeing people connect together differently where you see like tech and you see creative together 
like actually working together to make something that is is sustainable, something that is that that will be used. And so I think that whenever I'm looking at these businesses and I'm seeing them doing a lot of collaboration, not just for collaboration's sake. I like that when I hear people talking about sustainability, I actually get bored because a lot of the time it's a lot of jargon that people don't understand. And it's like, how are you meeting the need? For me, it's how are you meeting the need. And when I'm seeing these small businesses, a lot of the ones that I'm connected to, maybe in the US and some of them coming out of Ghana, I'm really excited because what they've seen is, I can meet this need. Who can I partner with to do this well? Yeah, so yeah. No names, sorry. <laughs> um, and Elodie, I wanted to talk about patterns very quickly. So what patterns and trends do you see emerging, um, if any, <laughs> around fa fashion and technology you know, or creativity? Uh, I'm, I'm going to sidetrack here. Yeah, um, what I see is people inventing stuff. So I'm from Paris. I've worked in pretty much, I was in New York. So I've seen the whole Shabam or Fashion Weeks, da da da. Well, now I live in Glasgow. I live in Scotland. I don't yet identify as Scottish, even though my T's are slightly disappearing. Um, the point is, when I, I'm in the street, I first arrived here and I thought, what, what are they wearing? Wait a minute, they're not following Paris or New York? Oh my God, I'm shocked. I'm raging. And actually, I think the, to, it's almost answering to your question before. It's about the good point is, it's coming from the people, it sounds so corny, but it's actually coming from the people, not just the young ones. It's coming from a lot of different people owning because of the body positive movement, because of uh, decolonialization of, of style as well, um, as you prove it very, very elegantly. Um, it's all about how do we own our own style without, I mean, you can wear whatever you want and nobody's gonna call you out unless you know, Paris circles and fashion, but I think it's disappearing. And to be very fair, um, the trends are even more difficult to pin down because it's not, it's micro trends. Okay, you have like one week on TikTok is going to be something, and the next week is going to be something else, and that's great because that favors more largely small emerging labels. Okay, because they are going to cater to a specific niche people. They're gonna say, look, that's my discourse. That's the image that I'm giving you. Uh, if you like it, go for it. And I'm not, I'm not willing to actually become the next Gucci. Please never become the next Gucci. Um, because Gucci is proposing something interesting. They all are, but it's a different discussion. And I very much like um, being at the O2 Academy when they all go out, those youngsters, uh, it's a concert venue in Glasgow, right? you have the, the most wild stylings. Um, and none of them are wearing Gucci. They're all wearing, I don't know where that comes from, but they are you know, conveying an identity and that goes back to what we say about how we relate to fashion, right? They're conveying an identity, probably half of it is coming from Primark, but maybe there's something that they borrowed from a grand sister or something that they thrift from vintage shops and something from your label and they're putting it together and that's what the trend is no trend, so that it enables a creativity that's not going to be driven by five major fashion week events, mm. which are actually totally out of this world and not talking to the vast majority of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm almost going to see fashionistas are dead, but I mean, I can't, I can't pronounce that for myself. So I will just leave it there. <laughs> Absolutely. And Elodie, what advice would you give to any creatives who are looking to integrate tech more into what they do? Hard one, um, partner. So fashion people, uh, the, the way that fashion education is done, because that's where it comes from, has everything to do with very little knowledge of material, very little knowledge of commercialization, production and all of this. I, maybe you subscribe to this. It's more about process, creativity, design. Um, now it's merged with fashion business, communication, PR, social media, all of this, but there's still a missing link with tech. So uh, I think I would call all educators, start teaching fashion people about tech because, I mean, how did you get into tech? Presumably it was not an easy one. It's just because you were very intelligent and were really driven by you know, ideas and, and concepts and stuff. Now, I think fashion education should also cater to this so that instead of producing fashionistas for Fashion Week in New York, we're gonna produce that kind of piece. 
Salim, what, what do you think? I mean, to add to that, there are a lot of the fashion schools now are actually incorporating the tech. I've just been um, talking to some people down south and speaking to, and they're including the AR and the VR and all that kind of thing. They're using Clo 3D for cutting. So that's coming into the conversation. And I think it needs to be, as has been said, because you, I am a creative, but the, the way actually I got into the tech space was because I got into cryptocurrency. And that's where my main customer, my community are in that space. If you're looking at my lowest hanging fruit in the US, 24% of them are already in cryptocurrency. So it doesn't make sense for me not to be engaged with that conversation. And I think most people get into the tech space made through cryptocurrency. So from that, I started to learn more and I started to understand more and realized that for Zari to be future proofed, I needed to understand that space so that I'm going into that space already prepared as opposed to it happening and we're, yeah. we're behind trying to catch up. And that's part of why I don't have to care what Gucci are doing or any of them are doing because they're only just getting into space and awakening to it. And people are looking for authenticity again. It's, about, it's, not, about, it's not about trends anymore. It's, it's really identity is coming forth and it is, does, do, do, does this... Uh, does this resonate with who I am? And so everyone's going to like something, but it's, it's not necessarily going to be the big five. And so, yes, the schools, all of them need to catch up in that because already the younger generations are in that space. They're buying skins. They're already, they're already doing it. There's fashion in that space. And so the fashion brands need to move with it. And that's why I'm in that space there because I can't serve my community well if all I'm doing is try to do what all them did and worked for them, that's not going to work for my community. It's not going to work for your community. It's not going to work for their community, which is why they're evolving and they're occupying these spaces. So if the schools don't do it, then what you're going to find is people coming out and they're not ready. It's already hard enough for people that are doing fashion to come out and get a job. How many of them get a job in there? They don't. So if they, if they can have the tech aspect, there are so many, the next years are going to be full of tech jobs. So if they have that as part of their CV, they can start their own thing. <laughs> they can revolutionize someone else's thing. Yeah, so yeah, well, education. To, to have this, uh, you see headlines, Her Hermes, how would we pronounce it? Hermes has a Kelly bag on the metaverse. Yeah. Hello guys, you're like two years late. <laughs> like students of mine, we're starting to build up some stuff for uh, whatever Fortnite yeah. uh, character they had five years ago. So welcome to the new world and goodbye. So there's, there's a point to be made about fashion school needs to catch up because students, future students, future stars are already there in the metaverse, however you call it. And um, yeah, clothes uh, sold on Fortnite uh, have been like reaching an all time high. Don't ask me much because I have never played Fortnite in my whole <laughs> life, but apparently it's a thing. And uh, yeah, better catch up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely time to catch up. <laughs> well, with that, um, I'm, that's the end of my questions. Um, so I want to turn to our audience for the next um, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, so we have app up here, which you're more than welcome, or for people watching from home, um, if you have any questions, please pop those in, and you haven't yet, please pop those into the um, into that app now. Um, but does anybody in our audience here, while I'm about to have a look at those, does anyone in our audience here have a question for our lovely panelists? Yeah, please. Oh, one, one moment, we just have a microphone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just so people at home can hear you. Thank you. Uh, so, hi, I'm Shashank. I'm studying MSCA at the University of Stirling. I wanted to know how's the market for uh, you know, using AI to generate images and patterns and designs and how you're using that. Thank you. Um, I have a you know, those can't do teach. Uh, so, basically, um, it's, it's been there for a long time, right? Uh, 3D modeling. Uh, but it's catching up with everything that we said about uh, implementing much more data within those processes of, uh, usually it's like automated designs. So basically you have a random, let's say a dress, right? You have a dress 
and then you're going to say, well, for next season, we need to have it longer, smaller, whatnot. And that's just like those algorithms which are going to put into it, right? So that it modifies slightly the design. Um, it's adaptable to sizes, different morphologies, da da da. So I think the more, so it's not do we integrate it, it's how much more data can we fit into this so that the, the systems are much better adapted to whatever production we want to have. That's very like high level, but yeah. yeah. I would say that the market is going to be, is going to be thriving more than it is, but yeah. you can see that there has been an expansion. As I mentioned, like your clothes 3Ds and your blenders, these are technologies that are being used to do the digital, digital renderings of your garments. And those are being used in fashion schools, but they're also being used by the big brands. Um, the ones that you know up and down the streets, they're using them just now and they're looking for how that is going to be developed out. Because again, it's about refining that so that they can adjust easily. Things for me, how it works for me as a, as a, as a business, now I have all my models set and has been said, I can adjust them from season to season, whatever my season may be. I don't plan on following seasons, but what it means is that depending on where, where I'm releasing in the, in the world, I can adjust small things without having to go through this whole prototyping phase. It's already there. So it's really, really necessary in that sense. And again, with the data, it means I can adjust quickly and then go to production based on the information that's there, as opposed to having to create things yeah. every single time, months and months and months. Yeah, and then using the predictability that we're, we're looking at now or forecasting to decide how you're going to do things. Right, so if you're building a new one, I see the market is good. Thank you. Yeah. If you think of what you see on the movies, like a man usually designing a dress and pinning pins, that's gone. That's, just, that's gone. Now, like, high fashion does it probably, like, there's like, 20 people in the world who are still doing this. I mean, and people who are crafting, but that's a different story. But in fashion production, nah. There's no such thing as, people do not snip snip stuff. They're just like, everything is automated, pretty much. And everything goes through 3D modeling. Think about interior design or architecture, the way that you use it, and that's about the same. Well, I would beg to differ that nobody's doing the cutting because my people are doing the cutting because we're small. Yeah. But the future is yeah. exactly that, that's where we, like to go to and that's not taking away those jobs it's just that people are going to specialize differently so when these so for those things those may be out of my price mm -hmm. ability at the moment but these are things i think would be important to how scotland's going to develop this out in terms of manufacturing making these things accessible to the small designers and skilling up those who have been cutting using patterns all those things because they're still there but the future is exactly what you're saying and the market is ripe for it and it doesn't mean that we're really uh, crafts and ability. No. We're just using those crafts and new, uh, formal ways of doing things like embroidery and all of this. We're still using it a lot. It's yeah. not because we are moving from something that's tech aided yeah. that we are losing necessarily the craft of making clothing. It just depends on what range of price, what kind of clothing you're making. Yeah. If you think of the bridal market, for instance, there's a lot of bridal dresses which are still very much hand-stitched and will always be because it's not manufactured. I mean, you're not going to manufacture at super level. Now, I mean, I don't know. Um, but if you are doing a pair of jeans, it's going to be much more efficient. And think about, you're going to have a 3D model that you can tweak regarding morphology of the way people are wearing it and expecting it to, to be. It would take so many times, so many, uh, yeah, time to prototype. Having it done in a computer via data and all of this yeah. is going to enable you to actually produce faster, more economically, and all of this. So yeah. that's, you have to think about tech as a positive thing that does not kill the crafts that people used to have. It's very important to state this, I think. It's an, an enabler. Yeah. It's an enabler. Yeah. And just like, there's no such thing as some, I mean, TV did not kill Radio Star, it just made it different. So that's. I have a question from our friends at home. Um, I work with students from both tech and design disciplines. From a career perspective, how could students prepare for the growth in the fashion tech sector? Um, to the educator. Uh, work on Excel. Work on Excel. Uh, do stats. Love your math. 
and um, ex exert creativity because there's a lot of creativity to be impulsed within the sector of tech, uh, especially on how to, to keep on uh, non, uh, sorry, I missed a word in English here, non harmonization. So keep things different because different is good and fashion needs to be different. Mm -hmm. If it stops being different, if it's, you know, futuristic, one kind of outfit, that's not fashion, that's clothing. And the fun is gone. Mm -hmm. So do your Excel and do your creative side. That's, that's, that's the thing. Do you have anything to I, add? I think it should be, it's like, it's, it's like so many things when you go, when you're in university, I think the greatest change and the greatest learning comes when there's an interdisciplinary mm -hmm. movement. So tech shouldn't be seen as something separate from fashion. They're not, and they're not going to be maybe once upon a time, but they weren't because everything's about, everything's always about improving. So personally, I would have them do projects together where they can, those who are stronger in one area can lend themselves to those who are creating. Because I think one of the things I, I learned, my sister was studying architecture many years ago. And I remember that there was someone doing building engineering and they used to get so frustrated because people didn't understand what was needed, like you create something, but you don't know what it takes to actually technically build that. So I think if you can do projects where they're sharing that information, then they're all going to grow in a way that's more harmonious to the future of fashion, clothing, whatever you want to call it. They'll get an understanding of the tech aspects. There are many because tech isn't an industry and they'll get, they'll get learning of the fashion industry. And again, there are many iterations of that as well, so yeah. Interdiscipline. When you talk about interdiscipline, uh, historian moments, a lot of techniques and technologies stemmed from the fashion industry, including production. So if you think of the steam engine, it was really important to, you know, uh, through fashion history. If you think of large trade routes that was open and coins and stuff like this, that was a technique, technology, whatever, which was, you know, uh, very much uh, done with the textile production. So there's a lot to be said. I mean, chemistry, nylon, um, tech, um, synthetic fibers, fashion and tech is not a new thing. It's not a new thing at all. It's been there all along. Uh, when they invent the weaving machine, the automatic weaving machine, it's a mega thing. First computer uh, programming was made for weaving, right? So there's a lot to be said about, it's not a new thing. Now, we have separated it for some reason. Um, interdiscipline is it's what literally going to make fashion keep on going. Um, there's always this idea of, oh, maybe it's going to disappear or whatever. No, 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 we we'll still need clothing and differentiation and all of this. It's just about interdiscipline because that's always been the case. So there's no reason why it should be separated any longer. Absolutely. Um, uh, do we have another question from our audience here? Yeah, please. Hi, uh, Ewan Devlin, a patent attorney. Um, you alluded to using machine learning and uh, big data analytic techniques to monitor consumer preferences and uh, logistic issues. Um, what role do you think biosensors and wearable biosensors have monitoring sweat, fatigue, people's posture uh, in the future fashion products? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I think it's, it's another layer, right? So wearable technology, has not made it fully within fashion. So I tend to distinguish clothing and fashion because that's kind of, it's usually merged, but that's also not merged all the time. Um, wearable tech, I mean, we all have watches now or sensors, whatever, it has not really made it through our clothing, what we wear. And there's only a bunch of fashion brands who are actually dipping into this wearable technology. Most of them are actually um, athleisure brands or sports brands. Uh, I think the difficulty, there's a lot of research also going on, uh, the difficulty of this is to try to uh, find something that's going to be beautiful, uh, wearable, literally, because wearable technology so far is not always wearable, useful. Tell me what would I need to wear something that tells me my cardiac rhythm. I need to find, you know, I need to find the, what's the point for me? What, what, where's my game besides being a nerd? I love it. So that's this. And, um, I feel also there's a lot of fear around it in the sense that if I have a garment 
So I'm not talking about garments who are going to be, you know, sweat proof or sun proof because that's largely done and that's very widespread. If you look at bronze from, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it right, decathlon, the way that you guys pronounce it, decathlon for the French people, all the way to Arcteryx, North Face and all of these, you know, big um, uh, Under Armour and all this, they manage these technologies now of fabric which are highly uh, performative. Wearable technology is another difference. What's, my question is always, what purpose does it serve? Is this to make my posture better? Well, medical uh, textile, it's not fashion anymore, if you know where I'm going with, is already extremely developed from uh, stitching text, um, threads, which are resorbable, da da da, to uh, thingies that you, I'm not so specialist there, but um, textile parts that you put inside your body to regenerate muscles, for instance. That's a different story from fashion in itself. So between the medical field, also the architecture field and construction industry, which is resorting to textile a lot for all sorts of different things, wearable technology, um, there's still something that's not, the bridge is not finished with fashion, I think, uh, because I do not feel like we have identified yet the bonus point. What is it, what purpose does it serve beside the fact that cool jacket. It tells me my cardiac rhythm, what's the weather. And so far, I'm still taking my phone for this. So I'm, I'm still looking forward to something that's going to link all of this together. And it's not there yet. Could I just add to that? Um, I was recently on a cohort where one of the members was actually, had actually created a garment, right? And, and whether we call it fashion or whatever, the people are going to be, athletes are going to be using it and it will be monitoring certain things that are going on within their body. And I think long-term that's going to, because sport is money and it's big money, but athletes like to look good too. And so they, they do. <laughs> and so that I think is going, it is going to happen. So it, they're going to have to protect the tech, of course, but there are so many people doing different iterations of it. I don't think it's going to be mainstream, but I think in the sports world, when you talk about athleisure, you're talking about, or sports, sports fashion, it will be there, but it's already happening. They're already doing it. It's happening more, I would say, in the US than here, but it is happening on a, on a lesser level here. There are so many people coming out of the universities, I would say, especially in Edinburgh, I've been hearing so much about it, where they have that mindset and they're combining the two of them together. So you'll find that there are actually people that are doing things. I, I could think of two already in Scotland that are doing precisely what you're saying, but di slightly different things. Yeah, and it's yeah. necessary for it. About interdisciplinarity, about how those tech people doing yeah. literally wearable technology are going to, you know, branch out with fashion people yeah. to make that bridge happen, to finish it, yeah. like literally. Adidas first problem. Yeah, yeah, Adidas. <laughs> yeah. Adidas, Nike, or like well, bidding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Nike's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. the wearable yeah. tech and the fashion yeah, um, yeah it's close yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well I'd love to keep asking questions but unfortunately we're getting to the very end of our time um, and I'm sure people are starting to get a little bit hungry um, so lastly before we go how can people um, people keep up to date with the National Tartan Centre with Wazari what's what's next how, how can they keep involved well, the National Tartan Centre, mm -hmm. you will have to be a little bit patient mm -hmm. uh, because uh, so it's a big, big project and I'm so honoured to, to be part of it. It's within the Stirling Council, so uh, you will get updates probably in like media outlets and, uh, you know, uh, everywhere when we will be ready to talk about it. But I have to say I'm extremely lucky. The Stirling Council is working so hard to make it happen and it's going to be such an addition to the city the region and the country. Mm -hmm. So keep up, yeah. And for Zari, you can find us at our website, still developing, um, www.byzari.com, or you can find us at Byzari on Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, and soon to be in the metaverse. Look out for the things that we're putting out in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna be 
doing, hosting some events in the metaverse. And further down the line, I'm sure there'll be a collaboration between us and the Tartan oh, yeah. Centre. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's absolutely going to happen. I have to have my own tartan. <laughs> Future forward. Metaverse. It'll be in the metaverse, yeah. made specifically oh, for the metaverse. Yeah, you guys can yeah. come along with but, us. You get a girl, <laughs> but not on Fortnite, right? <laughs> Could be on Fortnite. <laughs> Who knows? I'm open. All right, well, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, I feel like we really just scraped the surface and I was really sorry to see that there were about eight more questions um, up, on, up on the app from our friends at home. Um, so I wish we could have stayed here all night and thank you um, to everyone for joining us today. Um, it's so nice to see everyone in person and what a gorgeous stage. Thank you, Codebase. Um, <laughs> um, I would just really, really quickly, um, yeah, so, um, this was a collaboration between Codebase Sterling and um, Startup Grind Scotland. Obviously, Codebase, fantastic centre. There's always um, always things happening here, hot desking, um, etc. Always events every month. Um, uh, Startup Grind Scotland. We've got a few more events coming up in the next few weeks um, as well. So check us out online. Um, and, yeah, and thank you so much to um, Product Forge for live streaming tonight. Um, worked with Alan quite a few times before, and his his um, his streams are so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the playback, but just of them, not of me. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, guys. Thank A warm, like big applause for the for our panel. <laughs>